Hello, everyone. Hello. We're going to go ahead and get started in essence of time. Um, we are so grateful to have everyone here to join us in person. This is actually one of our many first <laughs> in-person events coming out of the pandemic. It's, it's just been really wonderful to see our students back on campus, both on our Westchester campus and now here at our Playa Vista campus. So welcome, everyone. Just a few housekeeping things um, before we officially, officially get started. Um, there's some food back there and snacks for those of you who get a little hungry because I know some of you are coming from class. Restrooms are towards the back on this um, side here. I think it's to your left side, my right. So, um, and with that, um, I'd like to first thank um, the crew that's here that's taking the time to really get us going in our live events and also for the planning committee that um, really helped put this event together for our LMU community. So I'd like to thank Mariana Villa, Villa um, and also Tim O'Neill who is here organizing this event behind the pillar for me. Nancy Donovan who is our CBA event specialist. Um, also, Anna Mangal, who is one of our professors and, and um, moderators for today, as well as Professor Kalasil, who you'll hear from in just a few moments. Um, so special thanks to everyone for putting this wonderful event together and bringing our panelists and just new content for everyone here today. Um, oh, and how can I forget? Special thanks to Natalie Durdeck, who is our marketing guru, who puts out all of our content for all of CBA and for all of our various events. So thank you, Natalie, for making this known to everyone. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome everyone to our LMU Innovation um, Symposium. My name is Nola Wanta. I'm the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy uh, for the College of Business. So some of you may know me, you, and, and if you've watched any of our webinars from Impact Insights to Business Insights, I'm usually the one welcoming everyone. So here I am in person, welcoming everyone. So thank you all for coming today. So with that, I would love to call up our fearless leader, um, Dean Dale Smith, who will officially welcome everyone to our symposium today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How are you all? I, I, I'm just going to replicate what Nola said. It is so good to be in person here. Anyway, I want to welcome everyone, say good afternoon. Um, as Nola indicated, my name is Dale Smith. I'm the Dean of the College of Business Administration, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you here for our first annual LMU Innovation Symposium. And today we'll be taking a look at the transformation of business in the digital age. And we've got a great mix of academic and industry experts to, who are very eager to share their insights. And I hope that you'll really give them the questions that are, that, that are burning for you. But I want to start off by thanking a number of our colleagues who are here today who have done so much to make this program happen. First of all, from the CBA and the person who I'll get to introduce, Kala Seal, the chair of our Information Systems and Business Analytics Program. Um, Anna Mangal, who is the co-director of our MS in Business Analytics program. Nola Wanta, who you just met. Natalie Derdick, who we also thanked. And um, Nancy Donovan, who's been our special events coordinator. And you probably, many of you know Nancy. She's always there. Uh, on the external relations side, we're partnering today. Um, and it's so great to see this kind of collaboration happen at LMU. So I want to thank Mariana Villa, who is the Associate Vice President, Vice Pre President of External Relations and Partnerships for this partnership, and our colleague Tim O'Neill, who does Communication and Operations Manager for this fabulous space. If ever there was a time for us to come together and reflect on innovation, I've got to say it's now. The pandemic has brought extraordinary changes to the business landscape. The future is both exciting and, quite frankly, a little scary. If you think about the rapid pace of innovation and how technology is changing just about everything, transforming just about everything, it is new products, new services, new markets, and technology and that transformation is happening in all of that space. It's changing higher ed. I recall during the pandemic within, LME, uh, within the CBA, we traveled internationally using virtual reality. We started a student club around blockchain. 
We recognize that computer labs are kind of becoming obsolete. You just want to plug and play. And by the way, quick announcement, starting next fall, the computer lab that's down in the lower level of Hilton will become incredible collaboration space for plug, play, meet, greet, work, study, et cetera. So we're super excited about that. Over the last two years, when you think about it though, technology has drastically changed the way we work. From meetings on Zoom, the Zoomers and Rumors, to communicating on MS Teams, technology has enabled us to work from anywhere and relay information instantaneously. We pay attention, think about it, we pay attention to our health, our money, our friends, all through apps. We buy and sell online. We worry about screen time and privacy. We can't imagine life without it. And yet, we worry about things like privacy and security. Cyber and AI are impacting everything that we do, that we know, the way we engage in our communities. And those are some of the topics that our panelists today will be speaking on. You know, it's funny, when I think about technology, I think that it changes everything, not only from how we work and play here in the university, but the financial sector and even geopolitics are affected by technology and the transformation and impact. Technology is ubiquitous. It is absolutely transforming our communities, our businesses, our engagement with each other. But the questions that we really want to be wrestling with is, are we transforming technology? Or think about this one, is technology transforming us? As we think about the business challenges we face in this rapidly changing world, the change makers and innovators among us are asking the key questions. How might we use technology to transform business and the way we work? In a recent meeting of the AACSB, that's our accreditor for business schools, um, I heard a presentation from a business school in France. They have created on their three campuses a virtual reality of universities. Their university has students and faculty and guest speakers engaging using avatars, and they're doing it in virtual space. It's pretty wild to look, and it reminded me of just maybe 10, 15 years ago when we were playing SimCity. Remember that? That's what it reminded me of. And yet it's real, and it's engaging, but it raises so many different questions. You know, when I looked at the pictures and the way the avatars are engaging with the students, all I could think about is, is that how student services should work in classrooms and with extracurriculars? and? Oh, it just reminded me of so many things that make me reconsider, and I lose sleep at night over this, by the way. Are we teaching the right things in business school to prepare you for this new and kind of scary world? Do we understand the implications, and are we prepared for what's next? We have to be ready to change beyond just learning new tools and processes, and I think we're good at teaching new tools and new processes. But our panelists today will get us thinking about something far more powerful, what's needed. How, as contributors and leaders, do we create culture, communication, and the structures for ethical and better decision making? How do we effectively communicate the impact of digitalization for our many stakeholders? And what's the impact of digital transformation on a triple bottom line world where we care about people and planet and profit? Because face it, you want to be around tomorrow too. How do we guide companies? How do we navigate that journey? How do we position ourselves for success in this rapidly changing environment? Industry know-how, new business outcomes, changes in mindset. It's truly, as Ray Bradbury once said, a brave new world. Jean Ross of the MIT Center for Information Systems Research offered up great insight when she argued that clearly the thing that's transforming is not the technology. It's the technology that's transforming you. Let's not lose sight of how powerful a statement that really is. While we're being transformed, let's not forget the values, our ethical perspectives, or to use a CBA term, the moral courage that we need to effectively manage and lead in organizations. I'm looking forward to an incredibly great afternoon together that will inform, that will inspire, might even scare us, but most importantly, it'll get us thinking about our future, what the future holds, challenging us to reimagine our roles and our responsibilities in the digital transformation of our global community. So I want to thank you again for being here. I look forward to our discussions this afternoon and enjoy the program. 
So next up is my colleague, somebody who's doing that transformation and being transformed in his own department, Professor Kala Seal, the chair of our Information Systems and Business Analytics Department. Please join me in welcoming Kala. I guess I'm short, right? Uh, thank you, thank you, Dean Smith. And uh, I think I'm done, because whatever I wanted to say, she has already said it. And I think, you know, that's probably the um, advantage of being the dean, that you get to go first. OK? So I just have to paraphrase whatever she has said and just make sure that I repeat it effectively so that you don't forget it, right? Uh, anyway, no, I mean, you know, kidding aside, once again, you know, thank you all, Dean Smith, guests and panelists. You know, my LMU colleagues, I see a few of them. I'm the department chair, so I have to figure out that why didn't they come, especially the untenured one, right? Um, and, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you once again, you know, for taking the time to attend the very first, I think, you know, LMU Innovation Symposium. Thankful for the opportunity for, uh, to speak in this inaugural session. And my special thanks once again to the pillars, uh, four pillars of this possibility, I think, you know, that goes to Tim. Where is Tim? He's still here. And then Nola, um, Abandana, and Mariana. Mariana, ah, there. Okay. Thank you, and thank you again, and thanks all of the staff who are actually, you know, Nancy. Thank you, you know, she's incredible. You're simply amazing. I've been asked to talk a little bit about today's conference, okay? So what is the theme of today's conference? Um, but before I do that, can I just share maybe two personal anecdotes with you? Short, I, I promise. And uh, the first one is to do with my father, you know, my late father, who kind of lived till his late 80s. During a conversation with him, and I want you to hold these two, two anecdotes in your thought till, I, till I'm done. So during a conversation with him, you know, when, when I was visiting him a few years before he passed away, I asked him about general health and how he's feeling and, and everything. And he said that he's overall all right, but he was afraid. And I was surprised. Afraid? You know, he was the head of the family. He raised a large family. He actually supported his brothers and sisters, you know, Indian joint family. And he was afraid. So I said, what are you afraid of? Is it your health? Is it the money? He said, no, no, no. I'm afraid of being irrelevant. And I was thinking, I'm like, oh, what, why? He said, I do not understand the lingua franca of your generation or the generation after that, and I'm afraid that I am being slowly left out and I can no longer be the part of this family because I just don't fit in. Hmm. Second one was with my wife. So I was trying to tell her about the framework of conflict resolution and the theory behind it so that, you know, we can, we can apply it in our own lives. A quick word to the married men, do not try it at home. Okay? <laughs> Bad idea. Anyway, as I continued for a little bit, she just got up and said, told me in an exasperated voice, look, all of these things work in your classroom, but it doesn't work in real life. Is that true? If the things that we are teaching in the classroom do not work in real life, then what are you doing? Are you being irrelevant, as my father was afraid of? Uh, I think today's symposium is to seek the answers to those, right? There is a paradigm shift, an incredible transformation that the digital age is brought upon us, and the old relationships, I think, between the academics and the industries must be reevaluated. In the past, Academics often drove the applications because it was cheaper to try them out, right, on paper, before you actually implement it and find it, it doesn't work. But now, thanks to the technology, processing power exponentially growing, and at the same time, the cost plummeting, plummeting pretty much exponentially, almost at the same rate, you can just throw it in, you can try it out, and then if it doesn't work, then you know, you try again. You can do it fast, you can do it good, and you can do it cheap. You do not have to pick two anymore. You can do all three of them thanks to the technology. So, you know, we are now at a crossroad where the practice is now driving the methods, the new applications. Because for the academics, we are in the pursuit of knowledge. 
For the industry, it's the pursuit of survival. Because innovation has to be a part of their fabric. Otherwise, in this particular age, they will not survive. The question is, is that also a part of our academic fabric? Because if it is not, it will start being irrelevant slowly. Okay? And today, I think we try to answer, we try to figure out what will be a collaboration, what will be a way of handling that paradigm shift. Um, I know that I kind of, you know, paint a gloomy picture for the academics, and I hope that, you know, my dean doesn't just fire me. It's like, Kala, you are no longer relevant, so get out. You know, but, but not all are lost. Not all are lost. Uh, I think we still have something to offer and create a symbiotic relationship with industry to drive the innovation, shift the paradigm effectively, and bring about digital transformation and be a moral compass for managing all of them. You know, because while my father was afraid of being irrelevant, he forgot the old adage. Till age 15, you know, your father knows everything. Between 15 and 45, he knows nothing. Between 45 and 60, yeah, he does know a few things. And at 60, you wish your father was there to guide you with his knowledge, his wisdom, and with his experience. So hopefully, we can somehow fit in into this changing world and still have that symbiotic relationship. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Seal. That was astounding and moving. Um, so now I would like to transition us to our first panel to address some of these questions, the paradigm shift, in terms of how academia and industry can partner to make a difference, to create solutions to a lot of our problems. So I would like to call up Professor Anna Mangal, who will um, introduce her panelists. So come on up. Gosh, that's a little hard to follow with what my dean has talked about and what my chair has talked about, but I'm going to give it a shot because you know what? I have panelists on my, on my panel. So I'm going to introduce the topic, invite my panelists to come join me, and then we can start the discussion. So this, this panel is going to be talking about collaboration between academia and industry to train future leaders, our students. This panel is so to introduce it, academic institutions have traditionally been innovation hotbeds for developing new products as well as training students in academic frameworks. That's one side of it. Industry has led development and commercialization of products. With the rapid pace of innovation today, especially in STEM and STEAM fields, is there a need for collaborative efforts between academia and industry? You can follow the theme. Should academia and industry be working closely to develop new products and train future leaders? Will such collaboration efforts help with digital transformation? We have here this afternoon a panel of leaders from academia and industry who I'm going to invite to come and join me, uh, who will discuss the need for collaborative efforts and share their own personal experiences both as students as well as leaders. We hope that there is a start of a paradigm shift for training students who are future leaders, especially in STEM and STEAM fields, where new innovations are disrupting every sector. I say that in my classes. Every business function say that too on a nearly daily basis. So with that, I'd like to invite uh, our panelists to come and join me, and we can start out with the introductions. Thank you. I'm going to uh, introduce each of our panelists and then I'll go join them. So first we have Rick Kehringer, who's the CIO at Wedgwood. He's also on the advisory board of ISBA here at LMU. I met him when he was leading Caruso as SVP of tech and then led Milken as chief information officer. I'm going to pass the baton to uh, Rick to introduce himself in more detail. 
Great. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, real, I believe that my um, history has really focused a lot on mid-size and uh, large-scale enterprises. So I've been in those jobs for most of my career, and I think that's the perspective I'll try to represent today. We have various um, folks on this panel, but I think that's probably the best position that I can play. Um, I've mostly been involved in real estate and financial industries. I spent t uh, two different stints in the Brookings Institution and uh, Milken Institute um, not too long ago. And those are the two areas or two different industries that I've um, focused most of my career on. Thank you, Rick. Next, we have Lucas Pierce. Sorry, I'm messing up the order here. Uh, but Lucas is the director of data at Snapchat. He spent 11 years at Amazon before joining Snap. He's also on the advisory board of our MS in business analytics program. Some of our students are here. I can see them. I would like to ask Lucas for a detailed in introduction. Excellent. Thank you, Anna. Um, and I apologies I, if I, I already know some of you in the, the audience from my advisory board work. Um, so I've been uh, working at the intersection of academia and industry for for quite a number of years, really since the beginning of my career. My, my first job um, out of college was working for Lawrence Livermore National Labs, which at the time was run by um, University of California. And it was a research lab working at basically bringing exactly this collaboration between academia and industry to solve problems, in our case, for the intelligence community. Um, I spent the next 11 years, as Anna mentioned, working for Amazon. And again, uh, I worked really in heavy collaboration with academia throughout that. Uh, my last role at Amazon was working in AWS, where I was leading supply chain and capacity planning um, systems. And as you can imagine, there's a heavy operations research component to that. Um, and you know, how do we incorporate like, the best methods um, in academia to get greater efficiency? As um, for the last four and a half years, I've been at Snap leading their data strategy. Um, and again, uh, that's given me the opportunity to publish various papers in collaboration with academia, um, work heavily with academics at a number of universities. Um, and tomorrow is my last day at SNAP, um, and I'll be doing more entrepreneurial work, um, as well as in a very fitting um, for this topic, uh, be doing some teaching starting in fall. Thank you, Lucas. Next, we have Abhishek Rath. He's a senior global engagement manager at AWS. He joined Amazon after working at Sony Pictures Entertainment as vice president technology. He and I have been talking about collaborating for a while, so I'm so happy to, that, to see that he was able to join us this afternoon to share his perspectives. Abhishek, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, Abhishek. I, funny enough, I started my career in teaching uh, back in India. Um, there is a college called Bits Pilani. I studied there and uh, I taught undergrad courses for about three, four years, qualified for PhD, and then realized that I want to go into industry and learn a little bit more, and rest is history. Um, worked with IT consulting firm called Wipro Technologies for a number of years, um, then came here on an assignment to Sony and never left. Um, I have worked heavily on the theatrical distribution, marketing, supply chain, um, home entertainment, television marketing, distribution. So you name it in the media supply chain, anything that you see. Uh, developed a lot of products um, and also sold some solutions as industry products, as SaaS solutions that in other studios are using now. Um, and finally, um, I, I wanted to learn more, do more. Wanted to challenge myself, so this January I joined AWS, um, and I've joined specifically on the professional services side, which is a consulting arm uh, for AWS, and I'm doing consulting for media entertainment industry at this point. So the goal essentially is to provide them innovative solutions for their supply chain problems, personalized problems, direct-to-consumer problems, you name it, and uh, lucky, to, lucky to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abhishek. And then we have Ray Toll, who is our very own professor of computer science at LMU. But I recently found out that Ray is also a serial entrepreneur. So asking Ray to share his career journey for both hats he wears. Thank you, Anna. I think I started doing, working in, quote, industry as a 16-year-old in the late 70s as a surveyor assistant 
worked my way up into working into the engineering office and thought I had it made at age 17 or so. And then, I said, and then my parents like, oh, you should go to college. And I went um, to this place called LMU, fell in love with the place, <laughs> found, a, found a great home here, stayed on for a master's after a quick trip to Europe, and started teaching right after. So here I'm in, here I am in my 36th year here. But along the way, I found out that it was really fun to you know, keep current with things, especially in computer science, which is a, a field that, that changes up a lot. I mean, I can't see myself in any other field. I just love how computers amplify human thought and speed up time in such a way that we can explore new ideas, as Kala said so, so well. Uh, along the way, I have picked up work at 11 different companies along the way, some startups, some big ones. And well, I wasn't the person that shelled out the money and ran the companies. I was, I was fortunate enough to help build a technology platform for some. And the latest two that I met, um, AWS happens to be the, the platform of choice for these companies. <laughs> okay, so happy to be here. I'm especially happy that I was invited by CBA folks because I think C versus CBA, I think all the colleges at LMU uh, work very, very well together and that's another thing I like about being here. Thank you, Ray. So now we will get to the meat of solving this problem. We've been talking about paradigm shift. We have industry and academia here. Let's talk about what we can do. So my first question is, the paradigm needs to shift in how we train our students, who are our future leaders. What does each of these groups need to do? Academia, industry, and students. Maybe Abhishek can start us off. Yeah, so I think uh, if, you, if you think about this problem, I, I don't know whether we can have answers to all the problems. We'll definitely scratch the surface today. Um, while I was kind of thinking about the topic, the few things that came to my mind, what is really the driving force that's forcing us to kind of look at these in a different way? I think there are four key things that I kind of thought about, and I'm sure there are more stuff, but these are the four that came to my mind. The first one is um, hybrid learning. It has got a lot of relevance in today's world, especially COVID has changed how we consume um, instructions and learn things. Um, second thing is uh, an expansion of the vocational training side. There's a lot of certification programs, short form programs which are very impactful to make you learn certain things very quickly. Um, third thing I would say is technology keeps changing so fast that how do you keep up with it? You learn something and five, five months later, it's something different that you have to learn now. So how do we make sure that we stay relevant with the technology? And the final thing is the social aspect. Everything that's going on around the world, whether it's ethics, whether it's social justice, how do we incorporate that into the education? So as you graduate out of the school and go into the industry, you become more responsible. And I like the term ethical courage. I think, Professor Kala, you mentioned that. I think um, it's important. So those are the four sort of areas um, I would say we can kick the tires and see where it goes. Thank you. Ray, would you like to add to that? Wow. He Boil it down to four great things. Um, I'll take a different stab at the question. I love the way you asked it. What can industry do? What can the universities do? What can the students do? I totally agree with Abhishek on how things are, things are moving. Things are converging in a really nice way. On the one hand, student internships are now not rare. They're very common. Certification programs have made their way into the university. I know that several departments in Seaver, at least, actually have certification programs. Take three courses and you get a certificate. And if you'd like to take those three courses and then come in as a master's student, we will count those for you, you know, so it's almost a nice gateway into getting a master's degree. Uh, the distance learning is, is, that definitely makes a lot of sense for, for certain fields. Uh, the community aspect, though, that's, that's the interesting one, right? Because, you know, if you're an undergraduate and you have four years at a university, you're going to be in a place where it's, it's like cool to take ethics classes and cool to take faith and reason and cool to take just a lot. Uh, it's just very, very broad, and there's no real danger in getting roped into something very, very specific. And I know that a lot of industry is starting to move this way, too. I mean, it's some industry companies or corporations, you get 18 months to work in different areas before you have to pick one that, that you like. And if you're lucky enough to work at a startup, then you get to touch every aspect of the company and watch it grow. So I like that the convergence is happening. 
Sometimes things happen overnight, sometimes they happen and we end up looking back at them and say, when, when did it, when did it change? I don't know, but um, my, what I really like to see is the convergence of, of the, the student experience, the industry, and academia. Thank you. I like the way you put it in terms of convergence. Um, okay, let's 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 talk about uh, let's talk about uh, collaboration. So, what is happening? What's already happening in terms of industry and academia? And I know Rick has been involved. Lucas has been involved. So, if you could both share your experiences and how has each of those entities benefited from it? The industry side, the academia side, the student side. So at Wedgwood, we've, um, we have a couple capstone projects that are underway, the undergraduate capstone projects, and um, they're very well structured. And the, the value, I think, for each of the three stakeholders in this case are for us uh, as a company, we actually get some new thinking, um, some more theoretical thinking, and out-of-the-box thinking that we otherwise wouldn't have, wouldn't get through these capstones. Uh, I believe that the students get a little more structure and a little more understanding of uh, the constraints that a company may have or the need to integrate the solution, in this case some technology, into existing processes and understanding some of the challenges associated with that. And I believe uh, the school, uh, LMU in this case, uh, gets a much better relationship with companies like ours to do uh, more and richer things but more importantly, uh, gets better, more rounded students, students that have been immersed in uh, the corporate culture. Uh, this goes not only for the capstone, but also for the internships. And effectively, I think the, the more we can do that, the more we can establish uh, good frameworks so that we can get consistency across the board and the experience for each of the three stakeholders, um, the better off uh, all three will be. Yeah, just to build on what Rick was saying. So I think there's, there's really two, two ways that I think about it. One, one way is just uh, talent, which is every company right now is, is struggling to find really good talent that has the analytic skills, especially the technology skills um, that face the, the problems that everybody is trying to solve right now. And the collaboration that you know, industry is having with uh, universities to get students that have those skills, everybody is just desperate to, to really find those students right now. And so that's one way that I think, you know, uh, you know we've, we've had for a long time. The, the other way, though, is the ongoing collaboration, which is a lot of the problems that we're facing these days are, are problems at scale. And so, in those problems at scale, when, when academics are trying to solve those problems and publish papers ultimately and, you know, move forward um, the, the cutting edge of research, the collaborations with industry give them access to data that they wouldn't otherwise have um, to, then ultimately to publish. And so, I see that sort of symbiotic relationship pretty frequently where, um, you know, professors at different universities are so excited to, to partner with us because then they get access to all this amazing data to, to, to tackle these problems. Um, but I also agree, you know, with everything that Rick was saying in terms of like the very direct um, collaborations on capstones as well. So both tie in really well because our MSBA students, they work on live projects with using data. Uh, live capstone projects and ISB undergraduates work on capstone projects as well. So tying in really well. Uh, so Reeb, you mentioned a couple things. You mentioned certifications. We have certifications. Uh, so uh, we, we are seeing more and more of online learning, certifications becoming available. Uh, they are becoming more and more popular. Uh, where is it headed? Is how can higher ed continue to stay relevant when such certifications and online learning is becoming more and more popular? Oh, good, good question. Well, it's... Everybody can do online learning, but some people are going to do it better than others, right? So there are, there are places where if, if you go on Coursera, the Coursera is not 
just hiring people off the street to teach classes. They're partnering with universities to look for people that are skilled in presentation and skilled in mixing theory and practice. Because, I mean, the, the theory is still useful, right? If you, you, the theory helps you. If, you. if you played music before, you know that music theory is going to allow your prevent your thinking from getting stuck in a box because there's more things that you can do. And it really helps to have a vocabulary to talk to people using that theory, which is you know, just a way for you to predict new things and understand new things, and, and that gets very helpful. And a lot of academics do that, that pretty well. They're able to, to talk in a vocabulary that's very helpful. And they are able sometimes to work at things so that you can solve problems at scale. One of the things we say in computer science is, if you take a summer course and you learn how to program, you can make a small website. If you want to reach millions of people and have hundreds of thousands of concurrent users, there is some kind of structured knowledge you need to have. You need to look at the world in a certain way. You need to know what's going to take a small amount of time and what's going to take a large amount of time. You know, you can't count to the trillions by yourself, right? But you can do things in parallel. So there's a lot of things that have grown out of people just thinking about stuff and solving problems at the same time. So universities stay relevant by being good at, at the teaching, the training, the, the encouragement of, of learning. Hey, that's from, that's from our mission, by the way. You want, to, you want to encourage people and give them the, you know, when, when we work without, without grades, if we're lucky enough to teach these lab courses and things like that, we want to motivate, we can connect with students in, in, in a good way. So we just have to be really good at that delivery. Whatever the modality is, they like to say that here too. Is the modality online? Is it in person? Remember, who, who is it that's, that's doing the education? Who is it that's supporting the students? Who's giving them the ethical training, the, the communication skills, you know, and the ability to work with people and build each other up as a community? Um, universities probably would, I, I think, do that pretty well, you know. It, it's hard to just learn that. Thank you. Abhishek, what's your thoughts on this topic from the industry perspective and also as a student, when you were a student? Yeah, I, I was just thinking as you're, um, as you're kind of mentioning, I think uh, I remember one course, if I have to just say one course that really saved me and, and got, uh, helped me in getting where I, I am today, I'll say system analysis and design. I remember doing that course in my undergrad, and this course may be a different course for you. I'm just saying for me, I think that was the course because what it taught me really is how to decompose a system, how to look at components and how to design something by getting a problem, thinking about it, breaking down into pieces and building it together because that's a skill that's very, very important. Whether you work in business or you work in technology, that's one skill you need absolutely today to problem solve. So I think, and that course, I don't think, I have not seen, that can be taught through a certification program. I would say that's a university, higher ed kind of an education where you need to get to, um, to make sure you appreciate the fundamentals behind it. So that's one thing um, in support of what, uh, what you're talking about. I think, I think what I look at, the paradigm has shifted a little bit, and we started talking about it, is because there is a debate right now about skill versus degree. Right? There is a debate that's going on out there about skill versus degree. There are certain things where you can learn the skills by just doing the certification program. So it's not a one-size-fits-all, but I think the technology or learning the common um, the core version of the technology, learning how to use it, I think those programs are, certification programs are really servicing that particular area. But if you have to apply that to a broader concept and learn about scale and so on, I think that higher education becomes important. So I don't think it's one versus the other, it's two of them together. Collaboration, collaboration. Ray, sorry. Did you want to add to that? <laughs> I was agreeing while you said synergy, or you said collaboration, I was about to say synergy, but we're talking to talking at the same time. No, I, th I think he got it exactly right. It, it's, it's partnership, it's working together, it's everybody using their own skills for the better bit of everyone. And I'm going to take that question a little bit further and uh, for Lucas. So yesterday's problems that required a PhD have become simpler to solve without sometimes even requiring a degree. So same uh, vein of thought, but taking it a step further. 
Yeah, yeah, happy to elaborate there. So, and, and I think even on this panel just now, you know, people talk about this concept that honestly I've heard since I graduated with a computer science degree, which is the idea that technology is constantly changing and the idea of being irrelevant um, as a technologist is something that, you know, is a, a lot of people try to put that fear in you of, you know, irrelevancy. Um, and if you don't keep up, you're going to be irrelevant. Um, and, and there's definitely a, a, a certain extent to which that's true um, because the technologies and the specific APIs or the specific whatever the cutting, cutting edge is um, changes. But um, there's, there's still like foundational things that, especially if you're, if you're getting a, you know, a, a four-year education that you, that you get and you carry with you and that no matter as, as this kind of wheel keeps on turning of technology, those foundational things you still keep with you as you get to the new technology. And so back to Anna's specific question, the, you know, one of the, the comments I was making is you know, if you look 10 years ago at the field of like machine learning, um, we had PhDs that, you know, were doing the machine learning for work for us at scale because we didn't have all the tools to be able to apply it. And now that work that took a PhD specifically focused on machine learning, now somebody, you know, that knows Python can use off-the-shelf libraries and just kind of plug in their features and they can get equivalent results to what that, you know, PhD was doing. And you see that same trend happen, in, like, you know, throughout a bunch of different technologies. And so, but again, like having those foundations of that PhD, they move on to like the next level of like cutting edge work. And so I, I, do, I do think it's, it's always a good, really good investment to make sure you understand the foundations um, of the work you're doing because that is gonna that is gonna carry th um, with you um, throughout your your career even if the the form of the technology continues to change. Thank you. Let's talk about gaps. What are some of the gaps that exist? Uh, so, for example, when we have students take our classes when they work on projects, even bringing in experiential knowledge. Uh, we still have our data clean. You, things are, problems are uh, where we filter out noise. But the minute you graduate and you join industry, those problems are filled with noise. Rick, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think about the uh, graduation from, um, let's say, undergraduate into industry, and I, I think that of that as a transition. It can be an abrupt transition, or with some of these um, engagement opportunities between in, or among industry, the students, and uh, the university, I think it can be, become more of a gradual transition. And I know that, again, some of these programs that are being offered by LMU with uh, industry are, are creating that transition and starting earlier so that students can get co a co the context and understanding of things that are happening in industry and be better prepared to make that step and that specific transition at, after they graduate. And some of those things, I think, have to do with um, multiple dimensions. When you're studying, let's say, and, and focus specifically on uh, classwork, et cetera, and projects, uh, you're, you're a little bit isolated, right? You're learning, you're very focused on this one specific topic or uh, practice. But as soon as you get into the real world, immediately there's multiple dimensions that you have to deal with. Um, you may have a lane that you're in, but all of a sudden, instead of being a one lane highway, you're, in, you're on a freeway like right out here. And there are other lanes that are parallel to you, and you need to understand what's happening in those lanes. And you need to know where your lane is and how to get into other lanes as appropriate. So I generally think that, um, you, that being able to transition earlier uh, is a, a huge benefit, because otherwise it's quite abrupt. You're sitting or you're doing something. It might be an entrepreneurial activity. It might be a corporate role right off the bat. But it's better to be immersed and to get some of the, that experience. And I think uh, if you don't, then it's going to be more of a shock. And it's going to be a detriment to your employer and you as an employee. 
Um, so the more you can do that, I encourage, uh, I encourage you to do as much as possible. Thank you. Lucas, would you like to add to that? Yeah, Rick already covered it really well, but maybe the, the unstated thing is internships are the really good way to actually get that experience that he's talking about because internships are where you actually get a chance to become immersed within a company and they're going to throw you the problems, the real problems that they're actually facing. Um, it, at least the companies that I've worked on, you know, we don't, we don't make up toy problems um, that we've already solved to give to interns. You give real problems um, that, you know, you're currently facing as a company. And it's that, it's that noisiness and being able to take the noisiness of the real world and then figure out, all right, now I've actually structured it um, into a problem that I can solve. That, that's the thing that most people get hung up on and I think ultimately ends up being called things like business judgment. Um, and you know, the, more, the more senior you, know, you, you become you know, as a leader in a company, most often the skill that those senior leaders end up developing more and more is the ability to distill signal from noise at a greater and greater you know, organizational level, essentially. And Abhishek, would you like to add? Ray also? Yeah, I think uh, if, we, if we look at what are some of the things we're looking for and uh, we're talking about previously is when you look at a case study, right? The case study is very distilled, right? And, and when you go look at the real problem, there are two things that are acting against what you have learned. One is time. The time you take to make the decision, right? So we, we have a term called high velocity decision making. How do you do that, right? That is something that's needed to, for you to be successful. Second thing is understanding the context. I think Rick talked about different lanes. Uh, it's not just understanding different lanes. I'd also go on to add in your lane also, what Lucas was talking about, noise is there. A lot of things will be going on. So the other important factor that comes out of this is are, how good are you at prioritization? Because prioritization will make you a success or a failure even when you get into enterprises. And I'm not trying to dim the future or scare anybody, but that's an important thing you have to learn. So whatever we can do in our programs to enable things to think these things to come through the education programs, I think that's really going to help you to be more prepared and more, uh, more ready to what you're actually going to face um, in, in the real life. Thank you. And Ri has some thoughts from the academic perspective. Right, I'm going to be the teacher here and, <laughs> and give the advice. Right, so I'll start off, I had a colleague in, in math, Alyssa Kranz, and she tells this great story where she says, every semester I begin asking my students what kind of problems they want, and they say, real world problems, real world problems, and I give them real world problems, and they're very messy, and they're open-ended, and they come back to me and say, well, we don't know how to do these, I mean, how do I get an A? Just give me something I can answer, just give me something I can get a handle on and do, and she said, well, you asked for real world problems. But, well, I'll take this messiness of real-world problems and then turn it into some, some advice, which is don't be afraid of it, you know. Sure, you, you're going to need to prioritize, but dealing with messiness is not something you teach. Don't be afraid because the people giving you the messy problems that the company is facing, they don't know either how to do it. It's just that messy. So get everybody together, right, and um, through that, um, solutions will emerge. But if you're afraid of it, you know, they'll pick up on your fear. So. It's okay, it's okay to not know. Okay, was, was that teachery enough? <laughs> and, and I want to just take it a step further. Uh, Rick, you are a CIO, so you uh, work with uh, technology skills, but you also work with business folks. So how does, what advice do you have to be able to balance those uh, students who are coming from technology, will be faced with business issues, students who are uh, B school students, they'll uh, come across technology because it's become such a big part of our lives today. So what advice do you have in terms of, you know, crossing lanes as you were saying or balancing the two? Yeah, so uh, I've been in this role, head of technology, for 30-some years in different organizations, some small, some large. And uh, one of the things that I've focused on myself is bridging that gap between technology and the, the business and operations. And I do have some words of wisdom for both, both uh, schools. So if you're an ISBA student uh, focused on technology, make sure that you understand 
uh, what the organization does. And, and back to system, uh, systems analysis, think about the processes that the business uh, uses and executes. Be a consultative, uh, be part of that. P please don't focus just on your technical skill set because that's very isolating for you and it's not at the level of value that the organization should get from, uh, from you in the role. And then on the, on the non-technology business side, um, do a few things. One is do not look at technology as, uh, and equate it to the consumer things that you have in your hand every day and that come and go. Um, enterprise technology in particular is very big, very powerful, and you should look to how that enterprise technology can benefit you. You should look to your left and right and understand your business processes, the inputs and the relationships of adjacent um, disciplines, and really understand that piece. That will help you in your managerial role. It will create more value and more, uh, uh, more value for your employer. Uh, and and make for a much richer experience in your life. Being part of an ecosystem, a big macrocosm, is much more interesting than simply in a microcosm and operating in that way. But when it comes to technology, look to the technology experts. It's a, it's a deep, complicated, scientific discipline. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, and there are, so, there are ways to do it well and there are ways to do it poorly. And so what I would say is rely and, and, uh, on those technology experts and make sure that together you can exploit the, the, the full value of technology in whatever you're doing, uh, it be it uh, for-profit, non-profit, government, et cetera. Uh, the, the application's very similar. Thank you. I will ask one more question for anybody on our panel, and I want to change the pace a little bit, uh, ask you to think about your questions, so we'll have your questions, and then we can come back and ask a couple more questions. So while uh, we are uh, uh, answering one more question here, you can get ready. Uh, there should be microphone or microphones around that could be the past or um, or uh, I'm happy to share my microphone with you. Uh, but Nola, do we have a microphone? I'll or? have to share your microphone. I'll have to share mine? Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, we'll, do, we'll do that. Um, and um, uh, so, so think of your questions. Uh, you can raise your hand when you're ready. But one question here is, especially to Lucas, you mentioned internships. I know that you're also involved in mentorship, as many of our uh, panelists here are. Can you talk a little bit about that? How can, how can that bring value? Or how is that bringing value from a mentor perspective? How does, how does mentorship bring value to the mentor? To the mentor. Oh, yeah, ab absolutely. So um, I, I personally, I like, I like doing a few things that um, I like mentoring. I actually, I like interviewing people, um, which may be surprising. Um, but I find that these are opportunities, like when, when, when you're at a company and you're in a role, it's very easy to, to basically build your bubble. Um, and it's a bubble of, you know, here's what I'm trying to execute on, here's, here's what I'm doing. And I, I personally love mentorship as an opportunity to basically exit my bubble. And it's a chance to be present with another, another human being and the problems that they're bringing me today, which are often gonna be very different contextual problems in a com completely different space. And so for me, the very selfish um, you know, value that I get out of mentorship is just that opportunity to be present with another person and break out of the context um, that you know, I get stuck in every day. I wanted to bring that up because we usually talk about uh, value to the mentee, but uh, I wanted to bring out that there's also a lot of value to our mentors. Would anybody else like to add to that, or we can move over to student questions? I'm yeah, just a real, real thought around what what can be different. Uh, I think in terms of the internship and the programs that we're running with higher education universities and enterprises, I think. I honestly feel that is a requirement of having a little more long-term relationships 
in this mentor mentee programs than just for the duration of time. And the reason I say that is because uh, there are two things happening here. I think what Lucas is alluding to is the reverse mentorship, because he's also learning something from the mentee in terms of what's happening, what the pulse is with the students and people who are graduating out of the school. And that, that relationship, as I can envision it, it, it has to be a little long term between somebody on the faculty or the student uh, on, the, on the university side and somebody on the business side having a longer relationship and then continuing it further with each of the internships that's coming along. So that way there is a more meaningful, long term channel that's open for us to do more things, innovations and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we'll open it up for questions. Uh, Nola has a mic. You can just raise your hand and ask your question. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I will go straight to the question. So it's a question you, to Abhishek. Abhishek, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, wanted to save time. So my name is uh, Arshak. Uh, I'm currently a graduate student at MSB program. It's Masters of Science in Business Analytics. I'm very passionate about problem solving and trying to get as many you know, opportunities to learn as possible, real project, messy data. So um, I would like to ask a, a question to uh, Abhishek. You mentioned um, system analysis and design. This is something I'm very passionate about, you know, how to um, abstract code and information, understand and break down uh, complex systems. Uh, would you suggest any uh, books, courses, projects that maybe I can do to understand this a little bit more? Um, this was really fascinating to hear about. Thank you. Yeah, I think there is uh, there's a bunch of, uh, bunch of things that you can look at. Obviously, there's foundational courses to do at the university. What I found personally useful for me is design thinking course. If you have one here at LMU, or, or somebody can work on creating a program, I think design thinking is fantastic to learn. How do you come from a divergent set of ideas and converge into something that you can work on? I think that design thinking process will teach you that. Um, the other part of it is really going to the question why, right? Understand what business outcome means, right? Every time you see a product out there, there's a reason why that product was built. How many of us actually go back to understand what that reason is? Yes, companies are there to make profit or they're here for a social cause, but understanding the why would help you also in doing the analysis. So anything around understanding how do you get to the why and start from there. And the final thing I'll leave you with is anything related to user experience design, a big one, a big, big one for you to learn from. Because those are the ones which will really help you. Anna, may I add to that? So I, this is for the non-ISVA um, students, right? This, the notion of understanding business process and being able to document, understand, and articulate it and share that is, is very important. The more that you can do that in the field in which you're in, the more uh, you will be able to improve on those business processes and work closer with uh, people in uh, systems design. So what I would recommend for anyone that's not in the systems design, I totally agree with you, Abhishek, but I, didn't, I don't want others in this room to say, oh, that's a very technical thing, but focus on business process. And, and use that to convey ideas and to improve your process overall. And, and it will be part of this collaborative effort with the, group, the technology group, and you will find that uh, it's quite rewarding. Thank you, Rick. All right, I'll, I'll give an academic and hopefully unexpected answer. Uh, systems thinking is no doubt one of the most important things around because in, in human history, we've gone from trying to understand the movement of planets and not knowing anything about them and thinking it was done by miracles. And in the Industrial Revolution, we started thinking about machines and it was all clockwork. Now we understand the universe as a system and a collection of systems and things like that. So a good way to learn more about systems, believe it or not, is to study two fields. Study a little bit of biology, in particular the cell. Every part of the cell does something and they do things itself. Study the brain or neuroscience and try to figure out how consciousness arises or emerges from non-conscious things. And study anthropology. Anthropology I sometimes wish was in our core because it's about systems of humans, which you will no doubt deal with in business and analytics. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, panel, for your time. And my name is Oliver. Uh, personally, I really resonate with what Rick says. Uh, when for for tech people, like we need to uh, think of self as consultants in business, not just focusing on the tech part, but also think about the business. So I thought it was great. Um, but my question is actually about uh, prioritize, uh, prioritization. I believe Arbishak mentioned it. And um, my question would be, how do you guys prioritize in your life? I believe you guys are very busy people with all kinds of things going on. And personally, we have like school and uh, like we're working on some outside project, we apply for internship, and we also have like outside life. So like when I think personally, I balance by thinking about ROI, return on investment, how much time I get it put into it, how much return I get. Um, but sometimes I feel like all I wanna do is just keep learning and kinda wanna put other stuff out, like just aside. So how do you prioritize things in your life? And I just want to, if each can t say something about it, that would be great. Thank you. I can, uh, I can get started on you guys can help. Well, this is a priority for us and we're here. Let's just start with that, right? Um, I think what, 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 what you have to think about it, what is the goal that you're trying to achieve? Where you want to be, that's the big picture thinking that you need to have in terms of where do you want to be. And from there, you got to figure out what are some of the key factors that gets you there, okay? And it could be becoming a CEO of a company or coming up with a new idea for a business. Whatever it is, just think about what are the factors that you're going to get you there, okay? And as you think about these factors, then have some governing rules around how do you decide what to do. Is it taking me towards the goal or is it not taking me towards the goal? If it's not taking you towards the goal, deprioritize those items. And at any point of time, I'll tell you, we, we laugh about this back in Sony Pictures when I was working and even everywhere else you will go and work, is that you will have number one priorities, 50 of them. Right? Because everything is priority. Then figure out what do you want to do personally? Where is your goal? What are the things you're going to achieve? Like for us, customer obsession is number one, right? As a value. So if anything that deals with customer, that's prioritized over any internal processes. We'll keep them aside for that's That's a tenet that we use. So you can kind of figure out what factors are important for you, and then what is your goal, and then use those factors to kind of make those decisions, right? It's a little bit deep process. We can't explain it through this panel, but we can talk more about it later on. Uh, but that's, that's my thought process. I, I want to build on what Abhishek just said, because there's, there's a, a conversation that I've, I've had with the people that work for me, always around the time they kind of go from kind of like a mid-level to a more senior. And the, the conversation is you're, you're going to now reach a point where you're going to realize, not that there hasn't always been, but you're going to realize that there is an infinite amount of things that you could work on. And the danger you're going to run into in this infinite level of things that you can work on is that you're now going to try to just work all the time. But unfortunately, time is finite. And it's going to come down to prioritization. And you know, you were always faced with this, but now you've just, you know, you're basically your horizon has risen up to the level that you now see that infinite field of problems that are in front of you. And so the sooner that you can realize that there's this like inf infinite things that, that you can work on and that you essentially have to prioritize and then make room for the rest of your life and, and how you, you know, basically time box, you know, what you're going to dedicate to these problems, the, the better that you'll be in just like an ongoing healthy, healthy state of mind, healthy work-life balance, all of that. Um, the other thing I'll add is and, and again, it's, it's related to what Abhishek was just saying. It, it is so important to question the values that you're using to prioritize. And where I think people most often go wrong in prioritization is they haven't thought deeply about the values that they're using to make their prioritization decisions. And so, like, like there's there's just so much in life where basically you know you're basically going along a certain route because it's what society tells you to do or family or you know any of those things, but actually getting down to like what you want um, and what what are the right value systems for you is will, will ultimately just pay off for you as as you're making these decisions. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm going to answer the question not on a personal basis, which I think was the original suggestion from Abhishek, but more on a, a group level because, again, when you leave the university and go into, the, um, into industry or wherever you're going, you're going to have to look at things uh, as a group and prioritize as a group. And so one specific discipline or framework you could apply and research and learn is the program and project management discipline. And there's, a, there's, I don't know if it's taught in these program uh, in any of the classes here, but it effectively helps you to uh, take those criteria and apply those criteria to each potential thing that could be worked on and helps sort out um, what it needs to be done and which you should be focused on and the order in which it should be focused, effectively prioritizing. And not that I do this, but I would love to if I applied that thinking to my own personal um, uh, priorities, I think I would be much more effective, much more successful. But those practices and, uh, are very powerful and, and learnable and very applicable in your daily life. Hi, my name is Melissa Gerber. Uh, I'm an LMU alum. I work full-time, and I'm a part-time faculty member. This is my first uh, semester. My question is, uh, I'm seeing some students emailing me questions that are very basic, that would not fly in the real world. And as a first-time instructor, uh, what would your advice be on how to guide them that these questions are not something that, you know, I feel like I should have to answer, but knowing that grades are important and they're very concerned about their grades, I don't want to um, discourage them from learning in any way. So I'm looking for ways to let them know that uh, this is something that you should figure out, but I'm not going to hold it against you, or should I? I'll go. Okay, I've, as, a, as a teacher, my, one of my mantras said with a, a friend of mine who once said, everybody's a white belt at something. And no matter what we think the question is, it's a genuine question coming from them. Uh, we answer it and we don't worry too much about it. Um, that said, we also like to follow what we sometimes call the personal empowerment protocol, which is before they ask a question, there should be some understanding that they are first going to think about the what, what question they have, even write it down to themselves if they need to. Then they should look it up, then they should ask a friend, then they should ask a TA, then they should go to the instructor. So they should kind of bubble it up. And yes, you don't want them to ask questions that would be trivial for them to look up. And that, that's where I would draw the line. But if it sounds too basic of a question, it's probably not for them if they're learning. But if it's something that they could have looked up or the question's not phrased well and they could have done a little bit of research to, you know, because they don't want to be asked the X, Y problems, right? So you want to kind of make sure that they, that's when you really want a solution for Y, but you ask X. So um, I, I let it go, but I, I've, I've taught for a long time. And as a new teacher, I struggle with those questions too. But right now it's not take it in stride, answer it, and remind them of the personal empowerment protocol. I'll, I'll, I'll take maybe a, uh, a little bit of a contrarian answer to your, your question, if there is such a thing. Um, so when I, when I first started in AWS um, back in 2010, um, I spent my first week just interviewing a bunch of stakeholders, asking them very dumb questions, like very basic questions. And, and I did this with um, team members um, in my, the new team that I was leading. Um, to have them sit in. And I had one of those team members who had been working in this space for about a year, and he, he pulled me aside afterwards and he was like, I, I'm so amazed that you're not embarrassed to ask all these stupid questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, but then he followed it up with, I, I, don't, I didn't know the answers to any of these either, but I just didn't ask these questions because I didn't want to seem not smart. <laughs> and and it, it turns out, like, I, I've seen more often that people self-limit themselves on questions. And if you genuinely have the question, I, I think you should ask it. And I think as a receiver of the question, you should, you should try to channel them to, to figure out how, like, basically teach them how to fish. 
And so like I've, I've managed hundreds of employees and obviously I can't have all of them asking me these basic questions, but I set up structures so that, okay, you have a onboarding buddy and hey, I'll, I'll point you to that person. Or, you know, I think you need to figure out how to create structures um, to like channel these questions or figure out like what better documentation can I have or, or whatnot. But I, I, I've seen more things go awry with people being afraid to ask the stupid question. And then as a result, the organization ends up going in a kind of a stupid direction um, than, than the alternative. Um, I was just thinking 12 years later, nothing has changed, Lucas. <laughs> I ask questions to VP levels. I ping them and said, I have a question, can you answer? I think going back to the days I used to teach uh, back in undergrad school, one of my uh, professors back then had told me, teach to the person who doesn't understand anything, the least, right? And that's my mantra always, even when I'm doing work at office, somebody doesn't know something, it's okay for them to ask a question. They may be coming from a very different background, very different circumstances. So we have to respect that and answer. Uh, and to uh, Lucas's point, not, no, nothing is a stupid question. They may ask the question, and to his point, I think you can say, here's the answer, but by the way, Next time when you have such a question, here are five resources where you can get an answer from. So at least that helps them. And our faculty, maybe if somebody's here from industry, one of our alumni. Hi, uh, my name is Tiffany Gonzalez. I graduated back in 2014, and I worked in public accounting for almost seven years and recently transitioned into aerospace manufacturing. And I wanna go back to um, this term of fear of irrelevance because I have seen this play out in real life. And something that I always try to leverage is this term called crystallized intelligence, where we try to leverage what people know, what seasoned people know the most. But a challenge that I often come across is, how do I create this feedback loop between emerging leaders and older leadership so that there is this continuous growth from one to another? Like, are there certain activities that you could think of that could encourage this kind of feedback loop? Okay, well, that, that question is excellent. I think it comes from the culture. Is the, the specific question about are there any activities that you could do to, to aid, the, to, to create the feedback loop? I'm not sure I know of any. I'll leave it to my colleagues on the panel to figure those out. But I can tell you from experience of the different places that I've been in here that it comes from the culture. If it's in the culture, the feedback loop should emerge if there is a if, if, if there's no petty jealousy, if there's a real encouragement for the people that you're mentoring that come up behind you, if, if you invest in their success and their success is your success, if you mentor them, my hope is that such a feedback loop would emerge. But um, I think my colleagues have more experience. It's a good question. Is it still on? Okay. Um, and I, I think, at least when I think about like um, irrelevance, and I, I love that 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 topic, and and uh, as I leave Snap, I think about it all the time. I'm like, oh, <laughs> what does that mean? Irrelevance. Um, and I, I do think um, it matters much more on a cultural level, at least that I've I've found personally than like on a specific like technology or skills because it's how, how our culture is continuing to change and what is what the the modes of how our society is operating and how those modes continue to change and if if i had to say how to facilitate it i the the two things that come to mind are just i think everybody expressing you know patience um, and an assumption of good faith and you know it, as as people you know are operating in different cultural contexts, you know people are always going to make make mistakes. And you know I think the more that you know people that are trying to bridge these like cultural gaps, or which can be generational, but also it can be you know across countries or, or a variety of different circumstances, the more that you just assume on both sides that everybody's operating in good faith and, and having patience with each other. 
works out pretty well. I'll, um, I'll give you three things. Uh, and they could, be, they could be related to organizations or just broad scale. Um, when you ask a question to someone and reach out to someone, there is a 70% chance, research source, that they will say yes and they'll talk to you. Um, exploit that. That exists, right? So um, whether you are a recent graduate or not, I, in my level, at today where I am in my career, I do cold calls on LinkedIn. If I want to learn about a new technology or new area, I just send a LinkedIn message or an email saying, hey, I want to learn about this area. Do you mind having a 30-minute conversation with me? Many times, people actually come back because who doesn't love to talk about themselves and their work, right? So that's human being. So you will find that that will help you in getting a lot of knowledge from someone, right? Um, what I've seen organizations do and have educational institutes may have it as well is we have mentor programs where you can enroll and somebody will be assigned to you and then you can continue that process uh, as a feedback loop. Another big important thing which I'm huge into in uh, Amazon and I was in Sony as well is emerging business resource group, BRG groups or anything like that. They are called different in different organizations. In Amazon it's called affinity groups. Um, be part of some of those things. Right? You'll get to meet a lot of people. You can find people that you associate with, learn about a new um, uh, affinity group or emerging group, whether it's LGBTQ, whether it's women in tech, whatever groups you're looking at, I think you'll get a lot of good people to talk to and then build those relationships. It should, LinkedIn is never about, hey, can you give me a job? It's about, can I have a long-term relation with you? And I'd say uh, volunteer for a project, even one that's out of your uh, specific uh, area of expertise. Um, if you can do that, then I think w it depends on the project, but if you can basically get involved with a project that does include higher level and more junior level people, you can learn both f from, from both ends of this. And I think just that immersion in that project will, will help. Um, there will be feedback, there will be communication, and you'll learn significantly from it. So great question and great advice. We'll take one more question from our colleague, Professor Brahma. Hello. I think I met all of you, the panelists in the green room. I'm Professor Ayn Brahma, and I teach uh, machine learning to the MSBS students and operations management to the undergrads. So obviously, um, I think one of the questions that's in the mind of all of our students is how to get a job a great job, not just a job, right? Um, so, um, you know, some of the questions I face uh, from our students is the value of various uh, certification courses available outside. And we talked about, you know, you can do both, right? So uh, courses like Coursera, EDX, or, you know, Data Camp, or you know, those kind of courses. So we do encourage them to supplement the knowledge what they learn inside the class with those courses. And those courses are not easy. I took myself to check out you know, one of the Johns courses, data science courses offered by Johns Hopkins. It was pretty rigorous. I had to submit assignment every Sunday by 4 o'clock uh, to get the certificate. So you know, all these courses do provide certification. So when I ask the students, hey, you guys should go and do this course, they say, okay, will you give me credit for that in, your, in, in this university curriculum? So no, they are not credit courses. Um, so question is, they ask, so are they recognizing the industry as a degree or you know, at least something similar? Answer is no. So <laughs> my question is to the industry, if they do these kind of courses and have certifications on their resume, Will you consider them to be competitive against someone who doesn't have those you know, certificates versus some, someone who do have those you know, you know, certificates? Will it make a difference for them? How, how, do you, how do you want to treat them? Tough question. <laughs> yeah, let me start. Um, let's see. Where do we start here? So I think um, good communication is critical. And uh, I know that they, they teach uh, different types of communication courses, how to write, how to speak, how to present. But I think that is a calling card for somebody that's seeking a new job. So the better you can communicate the value that you have, uh, the better chance you are to, to securing that job. Uh, I do think 
the, uh, I'm looking for well-rounded people for sure. So any of these certificates or, or anything that can, you can put on a resume uh, that makes sense is something that you should pursue because if it's all specific and wrote in one area that may sound attractive to some employers but sometimes supplementing that with more in, uh, more things that that show the curiosity of that candidate is something that um, will weigh uh, more heavily than, than maybe the competition I think uh, I'll just add to what Rick said uh, this is a debate how valuable certificates are. I, I think there is definitely a value um, in the certificates. What, what tends to happen though, it, it's, it shouldn't be a bullet point on your resume, right? Let's say you did AWS Cloud Practitioner or solution, Solutions Associate. So what? That's the question I'll ask as an employer. Okay, so what? Yeah, many people get it in the world. What are you bringing to the table? So it's important for you to construct your stories around the certificates you got and how can you add value to the job you're applying to. I think that is what is more important. Yes, you can have all these certificates listed, but somebody will ask you a quick question and you won't be able to answer on the technical side and boom, there it goes away, right? Um, but if you have a story and if you can apply some of that, you, what you learned, just don't do it for the sake of doing but apply that concept, right? Example, if you're doing AWS certification, maybe uh, you can pull up an architecture diagram and say, here is how it'll work, it'll provide you more availability and scalability. Then somebody understands that you have at least understood what you have done in the certification. So I would say crafting that story, understanding what problems you can solve, making it more of a practical application when you are interviewing is critical and important. Yeah, and I'll, I have a very similar experience to Abhishek here. Um, I, I, I'm trying to think of a case where, I mean, honestly, um, the, I, I don't actually look at the resume that much <laughs> in the first place, if I'm being honest, um, when, when doing these assessments. We rely on the skills assessment of actually, you know, does, does the person, you know, do the job. The resume, um, you know, at least, and, and every company is going to be different, and so I'm not, I'm not speaking for all companies here, but honestly, the, the resumes um, are, are more often used for a screener um, before it even gets to me. Um, but by the time, you know, um, I'm like looking at the resume, I'm not looking to see if like they have the certificate X, Y, or Z. I'm looking at, at it to like look at their job history and give me um, potential questions that I might ask so I can probe deeper on their background. Um, it, at least for me, like in, internships um, and experience like that will always trump um, certification. Um, actually being able to do the thing and being able to prove you can do it, you know, trumps everything um, versus a piece of paper saying that you can do it. Um, on the, on the more general topic of, you know, interviewing and as people, you know, go out into the workplace, um, my, my biggest piece of advice there is um, you, unless you're very luckily, lucky, you're going to get rejected. Um, you know, I can say I've interviewed lots of places and been rejected. And that is just something that happens. And, and a big part of ultimately getting the job you want is just continuing to show up at interviews. <laughs> Um, and even like I can say if I interviewed at Amazon 10 times, I might be rejected on six of those interviews. Uh, and that doesn't speak to me as a person, it's just who, who happened to be on the interview loop at the time. And so don't, you know, it, it's that ability to be, you know, like persevere um, through that and just, you know, continue to learn from the questions you got asked and try to do better next time. But also it doesn't speak to you as a person, just keep on going. Want to add to that? Uh, sure. Believe it or not, some of the companies that I've consulted with, I have been asked to do interviews, so I have been on that, that side as well. I can't really add anything else to what, what folks have said. I can, maybe I can say if, if you don't have the certification, there's a little bit less knowledge that you're bringing to the table that you can answer the questions with, but by itself, it is not, a, not at all dispositive. 
would say just get the certification for the experience, to learn something new, to show breadth, to show interest, but you're on your own when you interview. So these are great questions. We have another panel coming up. Hold your, the rest of your questions for that. I just want to wind up this panel. Uh, we have two minutes, so 30 seconds each, by saying any last thoughts. We talked about academia, industry, students. What does the future hold? And what do each of these groups need to be looking out for? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. So what do they need to be looking out for? We know that change is inevitable. Everything changes. When you, when you leave this campus, uh, there will be immediate change. Things that you learned are simply foundational. So anticipate change and be a lifelong learner. Focus on lifelong learning. If you're in the technology side, it's going to change much more quickly than in, in other industries. So be prepared for that. And when you're, I want to just speak on the interviewing piece, just more advice, I guess, is um, understand the culture of the organization in which you're uh, seeking a, a role in and try to articulate through storytelling, as Abhishek says, um, your stories in the context of that culture. And I think you'll, you'll find much more success than if you hadn't. Um. I can go next. Um, so from an from a educational um, institution standpoint, I think disruption is here, whether we believe it or not. It's going to hit you. Um, so before it hits you, we can be better prepared, um, I think, for, for it. So just being open to take some of these more long-term arrangements in terms of different ways of providing education whether it's hybrid, whether it's a Netflix-like catalog from where people can do some additional courses. Those are the type of things I would say from an from a industry standpoint. From a student standpoint, I think I agree with Rick in terms of being continuously learning and keeping yourself up to date and network with people, have mentors in place uh, that you can use. From an enterprise perspective, I can say the relationships have to be much more longer and more, not just research, research has to happen because new things have to be uh, created and, uh, and, and uh, to, told to the world, but also continuing in terms of how we do our work, having more collaboration and long-term efforts around that, which will help educational institutes to be more closer to the enterprise, and with that process, even students will learn more practical things. Yeah, the, I, I, was, I was also going to mention the, the networking aspect as well, which he, he just beat me to. But uh, honestly, if I, if I look through my career and like the, 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 the roles that I've had, it's, it's honestly been all networking. Um, and networking is just the connections with the people that you're actually working with and studying with and interacting with on a day-to-day -day basis. That's what it is. Like inter interacting or, you know, most of the networking, at least for me as a, a, an introvert and a computer scientist, um, was not like going to you know, cocktail parties and, and things like that. It was just the colleagues that you had or the professors that you had that you really enjoyed their class. And you know, leveraging those connections um, you're building, because they have their own connections and they, they put you in touch. And you know, that, that more than anything you know, out, out of this experience is, is a resource that is, is often underused. Okay, students are going to learn whether they're in, at a university, at a college, or whether they're taking an internship. You're going to learn for your whole life. There's a question with something about what does the future hold for academia, industry, and students. Predi uh, the future is really hard to predict, but there's a quote by Alan Kay, right? The best way to predict the future is to invent it. So hopefully everybody will have a say in what that future is going to be. Round of applause for our wonderful panelists.